Today's event is an introduction to brownfield sites. So the Summer Learning Programme is brought to you by Homes England's new Local Government Capacity Centre. So this slide really summarises who we are and what we do, so I'm just going to read it out for everyone. The Local Government Capacity Centre develops, curates and designs well-structured, accessible offers for local government with an aim of increasing capacity and skills to make homes happen in the short, medium and long term. So we've launched the centre following extensive research and consultation across local government and with a whole range of other partners to determine where authorities like yourselves need the most support and how this can best be delivered. And this summer learning programme right now is one of our first initiatives, but we have more, more to come. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just going to run through the agenda and then we'll get on. So this is the welcome and then I'm going to hand over to Mark Schneider to do, introduce Brownfield sites and give an overview. And then we're going to move on to the common challenges facing Brownfield sites. Following that, we're going to have a case study on Station House in Leamington Spa. And that's really going to bring to life these challenges um, and we hope that will be really interesting. And then if we have time at the end, we'll have a Q&A, like I said. So I'm going to hand over to Mark now if we move on to the next slide. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Mark Schneider and I manage uh, a project at Wolverhampton University called the Brownfield Research and Innovation Centre, BRIC. I'll provide a little bit more information on BRIC um, as I move through the presentation. But what I'm going to do today is just, I suppose, go back to basics, if you like, look at what Brownfield is um, and then really why it's necessary that we look at it um, in terms of redevelopment and then uh, some of the issues which make it challenging. So if I could have the, the first slide, please. So as I said, back to basics. So this is the definition of brownfield land, uh, which is uh, taken from a, a communities and local government definition in 2006. So essentially what it's saying there, it's anything that has had um, some sort of activity on it, some sort of structure. Uh, there are certain exclusions there to do with agricultural and forestry use, landfill, mineral extraction, but Generally, <clears throat> at break, we look at, uh, we class anything as brownfield, which has had some sort of human activity on it. Um, so it's just kind of the, the, the laying the foundations really for brownfield. So if I could have the next slide, please. So why do we look at brownfield sites? Why do we need to redevelop them? Well, there's um, certain things that uh, brownfield sites address. Firstly, it reduces the reliance on greenfield sites. As we all know, uh, the redevelopment of greenfield sites is quite, um, uh, the development of greenfield sites is quite controversial. So if you can look to brownfield sites first, then um, it's always greeted in a positive way. Secondly, uh, brownfield sites, particularly uh, where I work in the, the black country, have an impact on not just the site itself, but surrounding um, it as well. It kind of uh, it introduces blight into um, areas and also re uh, limits redevelopment. Um, and as well as uh, limiting blight, it also brings social and economic benefits as well. So it um, can introduce housing into areas, um, turn brownfield sites into employment land, and if neither of these options are available, convert them into green spaces. So there's social and economic capital really uh, to be gained from redeveloping brownfield sites. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So uh, that's an explanation of why we develop the brownfield sites. So then can I have the next slide, please? So just to give um, an example of um, why you would do this. Uh, so this is uh, one that's uh, close to home for me. So um, as I mentioned, Brick is based in the Black Country, actually at Wolverhampton. So what we have here is um, uh, three uh, photographs. So on the left there, we have uh, the Springfield Brewery. 
So this site for uh, the for those who aren't really that familiar with Wolverhampton is very is right in the centre. It's um, close to the railway station, and um, it was a site of a, um, a brewery for quite a long time because there was a spring there, Springfield. It suggests it in the name. So the actual site was abandoned in the light, late 1980s, early 1990s, because the um, the spring or the water source from which the brewery was taking its supply became contaminated. So the brewery closed down and the site was abandoned from the 1990s onwards. So it was 11 or 12 acres and various uh, unpleasant things happened to it. There were fires, etc. The, the big issue really uh, was that it was a listed building. So it prevents, presented a lot of challenges in terms of redevelopment. Um, but eventually the university took the site on, spent a lot of money on redeveloping it. And uh, the pictures uh, or the photos there on the right are what's there now. Um, so the, the listed building was uh, renovated and then uh, new uh, buildings were added. And now this is the um, home of the School of, Arch uh, School of Architecture and Built Environment. <clears throat> and this is where the uh, brick project is now based. So that, that you know, gives you a very clear example of taking something which was derelict and which was a blight in the town centre, in the city centre, and now has been redeveloped. And what's interesting is this is now an anchor site for redevelopment around it as well. So there's new offices and shops and uh, housing going in around it, and this will help to redevelop this side of the city. So if I could go on to the next slide. So on the next slide, I, I'm just provide a bit of background information on the Brownfield Research and Innovation Centre. So as I mentioned, this is a project that I'm managing at the moment. So it's an ERDF funded project. So half the money is coming from Europe, the other half from uh, the university. So we started in October 2017. We're due to run through until March 2023. So the project itself, uh, 4.35 million, as it says on the slide. And the purpose really is to help uh, bring brownfield sites back into use in the black country. And we do this by providing support to SMEs that are uh, interested in brownfield uh, sites and brownfield remediation. And we do this through uh, providing a minimum of 12 hours support to SMEs particularly, and this can extend up to 100 hours of support. So we have targets like all ERDF projects. So we have uh, for 12 hour support, uh, um, 60 SMEs and for the 100 hours, 30 uh, SMEs. So the, the figures in brackets are where we are in terms of um, providing that support at the moment. Um, so we do this through a team. We have a team of six, but also we bring in uh, academics from the university as well. So the 100 hours of support is more detailed and, and um, can lead to more research and development in intensive projects. So the photo down there in the corner is the brick lab that we have. So this is in the, um, uh, the building that I just showed on the, um, for Springfield. So if I could have the next slide, uh, please. So the, the, how we provide this support is that um, we have uh, um, a whole set of equipment that we've been purchasing. Um, so this ranges from ground penetrating radar, drone surveying equipment, uh, XR, XRF um, mobile equipment, which we can uh, take soil samples with. Um, so as well as on-site activity, we can take samples away and we can test them in the labs. Um, so we have an image of a drone there. We also have a, a 3D scanner too. So that's a scan of a building in Wolverhampton that we've produced. And we also do a lot on site history as well. So we research sites in detail because obviously if you know what's gone on on site in the past, it says something about uh, what could be there in terms of pollution now. So if I have the next slide, please. So what I want to do now is to talk about um, the challenges um, for um, brownfield sites, what, what are the issues? And this is going to be the main theme of the presentations as we move forward over the next hour and 20 minutes. Um, hopefully you'll begin to um, get an understanding of why brownfield can be uh, a difficult thing to take on. So can I have the, the next slide, please? 
So really, um, it's to do with unknowns. <clears throat> uh, when you're redeveloping a site, it, it's a very simple equation at a basic level. Um, you have land costs, you have build costs, you know what you can sell the houses for, you have profit. Um, so it's very simple on a greenfield site because there's very few unknowns. Uh, when you move to a brownfield site, you're introducing an unknown, which is essentially the remediation costs. So the, the equation is the same, except the remediation costs um, affect your profit because there's an uncertainty there. There's an unknown or uh, it's also known as a, a black bag issue because you take on a site, you don't really know what's going on on there. Um, if I can have the next slide, please. Um, so really what what you're trying to do with brownfield sites initially is to, to control the unknowns or to try and get a handle on the unknowns. If you can uh, reduce them or quantify them more, you're more likely to, um, to be able to understand the site and this also um, has an impact on cost as well. So really you're looking for information on sites. So what's happened in the past? Um, so this is a, a key unknown. Um, you have uh, information, but you may not have it early enough in the process of redeveloping a site. So you may only discover things once a site has been taken on. The information available is not comprehensive or accurate or up to date and really probably most crucially is it's not available in one place or easily accessible. So we find when we're working on sites in the black country, there is a lot of information available, but it's not in one location. It's, it's spread across a, a whole range of organizations. So if you can bring this together and provide information on these sites, what you can have is an impact on the cost because cost is affected by lack of knowledge and, certain, uh, and uncertainty uh, at a basic level. Um, if you can get more information, um, you can also uh, target to, uh, more effectively in terms of site investigation. And then you can also uh, make an assumption about what possible remediation costs are likely to be. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So through through brick, what we're dealing with in a large in a large uh, way is information. So there is a whole range of information available, and obviously you guys being from local authorities, you know this. The the the, the basic level of information is the land uh, brownfield registers. So this was introduced in 2017. So there's a requirement for local authorities to maintain a brownfield register. Um, so. At Brick, that's what we use as a basic uh, building block in terms of the information. Then we work with the local authorities in their in our area to look at their schlars and their local action plans. But beyond that, there's also planning applications that have been made to redevelop sites. So you'll have site investigation reports on brownfield sites. And then we work with a whole range of other organisations. Some of them are mentioned there, Coal Authority, Environment Agency, British Geological Survey. So they all have um, information on sites and what's happened in the past. So the Coal Authority um, keep information on um, activity related to coal um, mining, Environment Agency, flooding, um, previous landfill sites, British Geological Survey, uh, ground surveys, etc. We also include, um, we have access to old maps as well, go back into the 1880s and we use industrial gazettes as well to find out what's gone on sites. So, uh, and this all feeds in something called the brick index. Can I have the next slide, please? So the brick index is uh, something that we're working on um, as uh, part of the delivery of the, uh, the project, the brick project. So what we're doing is we're collecting all the data that we can and we've put putting it into an ArcGIS platform. So this is just a screenshot of some of the sites um, that we've uh, we have in the black country. So we have a whole range of criteria that we collect on sites. So region refers to whether which of the local authority it's in. Um, there's four in the black country, the size of the site's fairly obvious. Present status, that re relates to what's on this build uh, site. If there's buildings, there's nothing there. Um, geographical location, its position, 
in terms of uh, access to um, uh, like uh, motorway junctions, neighbourhood, what's going on around it, infrastructure, what's there in terms of water, power supply and planning permission. Uh, and the other element we're looking at was we're trying to get a handle on cost in terms of remediation. So we look at previous land use, we look at what the land is likely to be used for in the future, water risk. Uh, these three elements give us a cost of remediation uh, a range. So if I could have the, the next slide, please. So what we're doing with this index is we're trying to collect information on sites and we're trying to reduce risk for, low, uh, for companies. What we try and do is identify sites based on the criteria they give us and we provide them information on the most appropriate sites. So what we're doing in terms of cost, this is based on a report from uh, 2015, which is Homes and Community Report, which was looking at previous, um, trying to get a handle on costs of remediation. And they divide sites up into four categories. And we are using this as a basis to work out costs for um, remediation for the black country. Um, so, so this is just a, an overview, of, uh, as I say, to uh, talk about information, which is a crucial element of um, uh, the remediation of brownfield sites. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to, to Richard Boyd, who's going to um, talk in a bit more detail about some of the common challenges that um, uh, you face when you take on brownfield sites. So if I could pass it over to Richard now, um, and if you have any questions or comments for me, I can take them at the end with the uh, in the question and answer session. So thanks very much. Thank you very much there, Mark. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Richard Boyle. Um, I'm Southern Technical Lead for the, uh, the agency. I cover all technical issues from access, ground issues, um, utilities, buildings, heritage, and a whole host of other things on our sites. I deal with a lot of Branford land and used to be part of the National Branford Strategy team uh, when the National Branford Strategy was back in the day. Um, I also work on a lot of our strategic larger greenfield sites. Uh, where the common the, the, the issues can be the same but just on different scale um, so if you can go on to the next sl slide please uh, thank you very much yeah so there are many issues that you can uh, consider on a brownfield site but often they're really the same things you need to consider on a greenfield site often the same amount of basic information will be needed certainly there are some issues that may be more complex on a brownfield site but some may actually be easier to address than on a greenfield site Perception can be one of the biggest issue, one of the biggest problems, but a brownfield site does not necessarily equal contaminated and or a difficult site. The best way for any site, not just brownfield sites, is to consider the most important things first. Other things can then be considered afterwards. However, a phased knitted approach is always needed as some issues will affect others, so some issues will have to be revisited. So as we can see on the, the right hand side there, it's really important to start and think about what have you got for a site? What are the title and planning issues? What can you do? What can't you do? What can you legally be entitled to do? Or what could you be done under the planning regime for the site? And then if you can't get access, then everything else is a bit irrelevant, really. Um, so access is, is really the most important thing to address. As soon as you think you've got access points that's suitable for your site and what your future end use is proposed, then you can start to think about things that are in, on or under the ground. So things like contamination, uh, protected species, what are the buildings? Is there any heritage that you might have to be dealing with? And then you can go on to servicing and draining the developments of providing utilities, electricity, gas, whatever it might be, water. And then you can think of the implications on the massive planning and development. And then it gets into the next sort of stages. What are the implications of all those issues on the development? And then you can think about the cost, timescales and um, the risks. It's going to be a phased approach, as I said, and, and it's iterative. So you can't just you know, think about all these things and then end up at the cost, timescales and risks as we go on. Um, Far too many times, Brantford sites have master plan development uh, developed first, which then becomes totally rigid. Whilst the capacity proving plan is required to consider the quantum development that will fit on a site and to understand the many issues and having an inflexible master plan can lead to very costly solutions and or implications to mitigate the timescales. Sites can become unviable uh, very quickly. And so every site, doesn't matter whether it's brownfield or greenfield, a robust constraints plan uh, showing the implications of all the issues on the development is crucial. One is often not done, but it is so easy to produce and a very powerful tool in delivering robust and viable sites in a timely manner. And they can be really simple. This is the one on the right, uh, sorry, on the left hand side. 
it just shows all the issues and the implications of it. And from then, you can see what the development issues are going to be. So I'm just going to hand across to Ross now, who's going to start to consider some of these issues in more detail. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks, Richard. Yes, hello, my name is Ross Nicholson, and I'm the head of estates for Homes England. Myself and the team manage 7,000 hectares of agency assets from the Scottish borders to the south coast. In previous life, I was a director of a property development company specialising in commercial development, much of it brownfield in nature. So I know a little bit about this. Subject. So know your title. Uh, next slide, please. Just wait a second. So yeah, so know your title. Why? Well, as the slide says, so you can know what you're buying, so what you own or you're buying. It sounds simple, but it's often it's not. I was watching Jeremy Clarkson's new programme, Farming, the other night. He fell foul of this, not knowing his title, but I won't spoil this for everyone. What are the benefits? Again, these are on the screen, and I'll go into more detail on the next slide, but it's so important that you do this on any development. If you don't know what you've got, you can easily find yourself in real trouble and out of pocket through the development's life cycle. Next slide, please. Excellent. So I've done a bit of a checklist here. So number one, check the boundary. Again, it seems obvious, but like many things in life, it starts with the simple things. Mistakes happen and conveyances and transfers. And sometimes the scrupulous landowners and landowners and vendors may seek to deliberately change things. The recommendation is to get a land surveyor or geotechnical expert to assess what you believe you're buying or have bought. But ideally do this before the purchase. Ransom strips. The title investigations may rule that part of the property is in fact owned by a third party. There are generally two scenarios for this. The first scenario is accidental ransom strips, so check whether this is a result of an error in the document or an error in the register held by land registry. It may be possible to resolve an error at a title deed by applying to the court for an order to rectify the relevant deed, but know that this is an equitable remedy, so both parties are going to be happy with it. Alternatively, even if the seller does not have paper title or express easement, Assuming the relevant criteria have been met, it may be able to claim adverse possession to the ransom strip or an easement over the ransom strip required by implied grant, prescription, estoppel or statute. If the second scenario applies, deliberate ransom strip, then the buyer should consider whether any proposed developments of the property can be redesigned so that use of the access strip is not required. Otherwise, it will be necessary for the seller to negotiate with the owner of the ransom strip for the purchase of the land or a, right, or a grant of a right over it as applicable. Number three is adverse possession. The legal test for adverse possession is always the same, no matter whether the land is registered or unregistered or whether or when the adverse possession occurred. So it's not time barred. An occupier will always need to prove the following is true for the relevant period. The occupier had factual possession of the land. The occupier must show that they had appropriate degree of physical control of the land. So what's that? It'll depend on the nature of the land. Generally, the occupier is expected to have dealt with the land as an occupier owner might have been expected to deal with it and, ha and to have been the only person to do so. Where the land was previously open ground, fencing is strong evidence of factual possession, but it's neither necessary nor conclusive. The occupier had the necessary intention to possess the land. What's required here is not an intention to own or even intention to acquire ownership, but an intention to possess, occupy, and to exclude to the world at large. This will usually be inferred from factual possession, even though it's technically a separate test. And finally, the occupier's possession was without the owner's consent. To be clear, possession is never adverse if it's enjoyed under lawful title, such as a license or permission from the owner. Taking us to final one, restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenant affecting freehold title consists of an agreement and a deed that one party will restrict the use of its land in some way for the benefit of another's land. What can they do? Again, these are the slide, but they can limit possible uses of the land, for example, to residential purposes only, prohibit particular trades or businesses, forbid undesirable activities of potential nuisance, and restrict the number or type of buildings that can be erected. Again, to bring forward a cohesive and um, worthwhile brownfield development, these elements need to be considered because they can prohibit uh, the end result. So this has been a really quick canter for me through what is a very technical element. Um, but if in doubt, my advice is always speak to your professional advisors, speak to your solicitor, your commercial agents, uh, architects, and uh, many of the providers that go hand in glove with the brownfield development process. 
Um, and I'll pass you back to Richard Ball, who will take you through access, ground conditions and historic environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Yes, we're just going to continue our journey through some of the issues, basically. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I think we might have a little delay on sliding through some of the slides, so apologies for that. Um, but yeah, we're going to consider access uh, arrangements uh, initially. Um, and if you go straight on, thank you very much uh, to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so access arrangements is after you consider your title issues and planning, which we're not going to cover because we're thinking most people here today are, are planners. You'll know what you're thinking about uh, future use for the site. Uh, the most important issue is going to be to understand access arrangements. So this is the current vehicle as well as pedestrian access. These can be informal or formal and including in trespass, which can often be quite an important thing for considering about where people might be accessing the site in the future. You'll then need to consider the capacity um, issues for the site as it was uh, previously, as well as what it's going to be for the future. The future access arrangements for the solutions for the site need to be considered, and this might lead to increased or reduced trip movements. If it's the former and there's uh, increased uh, trip movements, capacity upgrades are likely to be required. However, one of the benefits of Brownford sites is that one or more access points are likely to already exist. And if the site has been recently closed, it might be that those access points um, means that there's no, and the actual trips that the, the former site used to have means there's no impact to the local network as the future development is either equal or less than movements in the former use. If capacity upgrades are required, these often be delivered in a phased way to facilitate viable uh, development. Often, sometimes in planning, uh, local authorities want all up, off-site upgrades to be done immediately, but often the, uh, the, the viability issues can be quite pronounced on that. So a phased way is always far easier um, for the viability of the site. It might be possible that ransom strips may be present uh, that impact any of the above. Um, this is more common on the Greenfield site than a Brownfield site, to be honest, um, simply because that uh, for Brownfield site, the site has already had access at some you know, way or, or form. And it's even an affidavit could be a, obtained to, uh, from, from previous employers or users to see if access, uh, an adverse claim could be made. Just going on to the next slides, please. We're going to now consider ground conditions. Uh, and go on to the next slide as well, please. So the issues surrounding ground conditions can be wide and far reaching for any site, not just Brownfield. And along the bottom there, there's several things that might be affecting the site. Topographical issues are often completely overlooked, but they often can be quite important to consider as reprofiling the site through cut and fill um, and or for access implications, especially for future adopted roads, um, can be quite important. Land take is often completely forgotten about, about these things that could reduce the development area. The historical and geo-environmental setting, such as geology and controlled waters, needs to be considered to understand if any contamination may be present, either on or off the site, that may require remedial and or mitigation measures. Geotechnical and mining issues may influence the, the geotechnical stability of the site, that might require stabilisation themselves or extra foundation solutions to be required, so effectively brownfield sites become an abnormal. Geo-environmental conditions might also affect what's going to happen with drainage, especially with suds, uh, such as infiltration, which might not be possible due to contamination. And then you might have invasive species that can slow or even prevent remedial activities. And we're going to consider a few of these issues in, over the next few slides. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. Um, the first thing, just as the slides are catching up, so apologies again about that. One well, of the next things to consider is unexploded ordnance or some, sometimes uh, uh, shortlisted to uh, UXO. It's effectively discharged, uh, ordnance that hasn't discharged and covers bombs and small arms. It's vitally important to consider these as the risk can be quite acute as shown relatively recently by high profile encounters in Birmingham where the A38M was closed for several days and Exeter that made the national news. However, it's not actually that uncommon. This is a map of uh, on the, the right as provided by Zetica, of all known ordnance issues around the Bristol area. As you can see, there's an enormous amount of them. Uh, so it's not actually that uncommon, and it's not just a brownfield issue. Uh, UXO mainly dates from World War II and can be found around urban areas and strategic sites. Um, it's estimated that about 10% of all bombs failed to detonate. 
Uh, it also affects forming military bases and firing ranges too, but ordnance can be found just below the surface or many metres deep, and they're often unearthed by construction and or investigation activities. So it's really important to consider the issue really up front as it can affect a lot of the investigations you're going to have to do on the site. If you can go on to the next slide, please. So as Mark has outlined, contamination often most the biggest issue that people most worry about on sites. Although I've said before, not all brownfield sites are actually contaminated, or if they are, the contamination is actually not, it can be quite easy to deal with. Contamination arises from very, you know, a very wide range of previous uses, but it is also naturally occurring, and many types of natural geology found in the UK can give off a huge range of contaminants. So it's not just from human uses that has to be considered. The great feature of the UK set is that, as Mark said, we have lots of maps going back to the early 1800s and even before in some cases. We even have Russian maps that were found on a random train when the Cold War end, uh, ended that we have uh, decoded uh, and translated that are actually more detailed than the OS maps of the time. They're highly accurate and we can be used for, uh, to understand the site and provide a comprehensive profile of the site and see what contaminants can be actually, uh, 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 actually on site. The green table to the side, um, I don't know whether it's actually that clear, so apologies for that, but it just goes to show various industrial uses can generate various different types of contaminants. There are literally hundreds of different contaminants you might be uh, considering on the site, but understanding the previous uses allow you to refine and think about what you might be targeting on site. You don't have to look for every single contaminant on every single site. Um, the contaminants can be the what's called point source, or sometimes people call them hotspots. I hate that term, uh, but you know people call them hotspots. It's quite a simple thing, just you know, really isolated parts of uh, um, um, where contamination might be. Often, poor husbandry was really bad on sites. People just got an oil drum, tipped it outside the back door of the you know the factory. Very very common thing to do. So you just end up with some contamination in a, in one area, or you might have dis dispersed and diffuse contamination across the site. This is not actually just related to the site that you might be looking at, but some areas, especially London, other urban areas, can be very contaminated. Many contaminants have actually been deposited from the air and actually urban areas, residential areas that are away from any contaminant, you know, really industrial activities might be quite contaminated. It's just sort of one of those things about urban areas. The con contamination can affect ground materials, controlled water, so water in the environment, uh, and or cause ground gases to be produced. One of the biggest issues that a very complex re regulatory regime exists, both of the local planning authority and the environment agency being regulators. And there's also overlaps between the waste and permitting regimes too. You'll always need an intrusive investigation to either prove or disprove contamination. You can't just look at a site and think that might be contaminated or that might not be contaminated. I've looked at some sites where I was expecting to be contaminated before, but they're not actually that contaminated and vice versa. I've looked at greenfield sites where we found landfills that nobody knew existed so it's not just a brownfield issue we can all look at it from a source pathway receptor model we literally look at what's called the conceptual site model the little picture on the uh, bottom uh, right just shows how simple some of these things can be this was a uh, the conceptual site model developed for avenue coat works this cost about 200 million pounds to clean up it was about 180 hectares or thereabouts but it is all summed up in one simple to describe figure. And if you can't draw it, you don't understand it effectively. People always talk about sites being clean, but they don't have to be clean. They just have to be suitable for use. That's all the principal planning test is. And actually, sometimes the right end use can mean that no remediation is actually needed, which is why contamination can actually be a perception issue than a real issue. Um, if just go on to the next slide, please. Ground gases can be a, an acute or chronic risk. It depends how much gas there is. Um, Acute, it can be very, uh, very pronounced. The uh, top right, although we're waiting for uh, slides to, to catch up, so I do apologise. Um, but on, when the next slide comes along, you'll see, a, there we are, it's just popped up. You'll see a building, a house that was actually demolished. This was in Lusco in Derbyshire uh, back in the 1980s. A landfill was quite close to the site and gas actually migrated from the landfill into the building uh, from a sudden fall in barometric pressure overnight. When the heating clicked on in the morning, the house blew up and, as you can see, was completely um, yeah, devastated. Luckily, no one was killed or even injured, but there have been deaths in other countries. But what has happened in the UK is acute incidents from asphyxiants like carbon dioxide or poisonous gases. And this often happens in the downstairs toilet and don't want me to be crude, so I do apologise, but people often spend a little bit too much time sitting on the downstairs toilet. 
carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide can come up to the, through the soil pipe and have killed people um, from yeah going about their bodily functions. Um, some mitigation measures can be provided, but not all low-rise properties can use everything. And this is because pumps are often needed and you can't let um, effectively private residents just have these in the site. They turn them off and then we get into a ground gas regime. Radon is also an issue. It's similar, but it's effectively uh, radon is produced from deg degradation of natural rocks. So it's very common across the whole of the UK, not just a Brownfield issue. And if we go on to the next slide, please. I'm just going to consider mining issues. Uh, again, this is Brownfield as well as Greenfield sites. Um, and it affects very large um, areas of the, 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 the UK. Uh, you can see there in the black um, overlay of, of the UK, that's where coal mining areas are. And the Coal Mining Authority is effectively responsible for all coal mining um, issues, issues and liabilities on the site. In the red uh, map to UK, that's where all other mining is carried out. And as you can see, that's a far um, bigger overlay of the UK. However, we know where most coal mining happened, or at least theoretically should have happened from the geology. Uh, for non-coal mining, um, the, you know, even from the Romans or before, things have been uh, heavily mined in the UK. We don't know where it all is. We don't know where a lot of historical mines are. So in general, no one's responsible for it and you can come across it completely unexpectedly. It can be very expensive to mitigate and often intrusive investigation is the only way to consider. But just because the site was developed previously doesn't mean that the future site won't have to actually mitigate the, the, uh, the, the risks. Effectively, regulation is tighter these days. Just looking at historic environment now, so if you can go on perhaps two slides straight away, please. Uh, this is a very important issue to consider. There are obviously lots of statutory issues to consider that are very you know, legally protected. Uh, things like World Heritage Sites, scheduled monuments, listed buildings, those sort of things. Um, some slightly more random things that could affect coastal um, uh, brown for sites like protected wrecks, um, but there's a lot of things that can impact a site. We then also have sort of the non-designated heritage assets and conservation areas maybe locally listed important buildings, um, could be monuments, issues, statues, that sort of thing as well. Now, you might need to understand these and have remedial or management issues required to protect the facility whilst you're going through planning. But especially for locally listed buildings, I know planners always want to protect these and you know I'm not being you know, derogatory at all, but often it's very important or, and often a lot easier to sort of effectively sister, th si sorry, I can't say, sympathetically em emulate interesting features in the future development and save the buildings rather than save the buildings the conversion can be very difficult especially complying with building regulations the walls aren't properly insulated windows very might be very uh, large so it's very difficult to control overheating um, floors can be very high so again very difficult to actually um, convert into residential however a bit of a benefit about brownfield sites is because of the previous uses a lot of the historical issues on site might have actually been destroyed, um, especially if significant regrading has been done and or basements are present. So I'm just going to hand across now to, to Lisa, who's going to carry on the journey. Thanks, Richard. Hello, I'm Lisa Palfreman. I work as Senior Technical Manager Environment for Homes England. I lead on, lead on biodiversity net gain and advising on related issues around environmental planning. So next slide, please. While we're waiting for that to come up, sometimes there's a misconception that greenfield sites are the best for wildlife and that brownfield sites are no good. Um, but there isn't really a hard and fast rule. So many brownfield sites do indeed have low ecological value, but others can be home to the more common protected species such as bats and great crested newts. And there are also some rarer species that are mainly found on brownfield sites. So I'd say the absolute key to dealing with e ecological issues is to get expert advice from a professional ecologist as soon as you start planning your project to basically find out what you're dealing with. Uh, brownfield sites often characterised by a history of disturbance and abandonment, and they end up with often with very many different habitats in a relatively small area. Um, you usually have quite thin, poor soils, so you end up with a bigger diversity of flowering plants, the kinds of plants that are usually outcompeted by the do more dominant species like dandelion and ivy. There might be pools of standing water and also areas of bare ground that heat up quickly, and that creates ideal conditions for reptiles like grass snakes. Um, the fact also that most human activities excluded from these sites can they make them attractive then to birds and bats because they don't experience the sort of noise and light pollution that they might do on an operational site or in a residential area. And they can also be attracted to buildings that have fallen into disrepair when they're looking for new roost or nest sites. 
So advice from a professional ecologist and then an ecological report or impact assessment is really key. Um, a good starting point is an extended phase one habitat survey. Basically, this takes a, a look at the site as a whole, identifies all the habitats and then works out which other surveys are needed. So protected species surveys for bats and reptiles. The main issue with surveys, other than the phase one survey, which might be possible through most of the year, is that they have the restricted timings. They can only be carried out at certain times in the year. And that's really essential then to take account of when you're drawing up your, your planning programme. Um, biodiversity net gain will become a mandatory requirement uh, following a transition period once the Environment Bill is enacted. And this is basically around making sure that there's measurably more nature after development than before. And already some local plans are requiring planning applications to show a particular level of biodiversity net gain. So do check what the, the local requirements are. There's a targeted exemption in the bill for certain brownfield sites that don't have any priority habitats or species and that face genuine difficulties in delivering viable development. We're expecting a bit more information about that uh, from DEFRA later in the year. The evidence based of survey work is essential for developing your plans in line with the mitigation hierarchy. And this is about avoiding ecological impacts as far as possible, mitigating those that can't be avoided and then comp compensating for any unacceptable impacts that remain. And that's in line with the national planning policy framework. Next slide, please. So basically, an ecologist would be able to advise of any species or habitats found on the site that have particular status in the planning process um, by being a material consideration that has to be taken into account when the decision is made. And also those that have a particular status in law, um, having special protection when it comes to demolition and construction activities. Um, the, two, the 2006 NERC Act, that's the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act, basically lists out what's considered to be priority habitats and species. And the priority habitat that can be a particular issue on brownfield sites is this open mosaic habitat on previously developed land category, which is, as, it, as the name suggests, is only found on brownfield sites. It's basically characterised by having disturbed or imported soils and also particular vegetation communities that, again, an ecologist could identify. Um, the DEFRA MAGIC map, which is publicly available, um, does include a map of all the priority habitats, but really you do need to do some sort of ground truthing to make sure that the site survey um, can identify what the conditions are actually like on the ground. Priority species of, habit of interest that can pop up on brownfield sites include some of the rarer invertebrates, certain beetle, reptile and amphibian species, again, including the great crested newt. So it really goes to show the, the need for getting that, those site surveys. And assuming planning permission is granted for the scheme, planning conditions and obligations may be set around ecology, which can include how to deal with these species if they're found on the site. When it comes to site clearance and remediation and demolition work, um, the activities that can affect certain legally protected species, such as particularly bats, great crested newts, are likely to require a Natural England mitigation licence before they can take place. Again, looking for a named ecologist who can prepare the application for you and look at what mitigation and compensation measures need to be delivered. And then they would remain involved through that um, the site works as well. The kinds of mitigation measures that might commonly be uh, looked at include carrying out works under an ecological watching brief and that means moving animals that are affected out of harm's way during the works, planting schemes to replace um, lost habitat, creation of artificial roosts or resting places which could include say a bat house if, if a, a roost has to be demolished and also then translocation which means moving animals from the development site to a more suitable site elsewhere. Next slide please. So leaving ecology behind a little bit and talking more about invasive species. Um, these can be an issue, as Richard's already mentioned, on, on uh, brownfield sites in particular. An invasive uh, species is basically any non-native animal or plant that has the ability to spread and in doing so cause damage, which leads to financial costs. So in a development context, invasive plant species are the most uh, of concern, particularly uh, species like Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam. Um, these are the two of the more common and costly uh, species to remove. So Japanese knotweed estimated to cost in the UK around £160 million each year and also impacting on property values as well, particularly because it's really difficult to remove. As a landowner, you're legally required to prevent invasive species leaving your site, spreading into the wild or onto neighbouring properties and also uh, required to dispose of any plant material properly. And then as a developer, you're likely to want to remove invasive species anyway to reduce development li uh, risk and because it can be a requirement of planning. The cost can be quite significant, running into six figures, so depending on the, the area affected and the extent of contamination. 
There are various removal options, but the more likely ones for larger development sites will be chemical spraying over several years or physical removal and landfill at a site that's authorised to take the material. And you usually involve a specialist contractor for that. And the contract would need to operate within environment agency rules, including having the right environmental permit for the activities they're carrying out. Once an invasive species problem is identified, the removal methods will usually be set out for the client in a, an agreed management and remediation plan. And that also needs to take account of any ecological issues or other site constraints such as overhead power lines. The cost of this work really means that advanced planning again is essential. And if you're looking for specialist contractors, there's trade bodies, so the two I've mentioned here, are the, non, uh, the Invasive Non-Native Specialist Association and also the Property Care Association. So I'll now pass back to Richard to continue his session. Thank you very much there, Lisa. Um, if you can go on to the next um, slide, please. Um, so we're going to start to consider buildings and structures now. Um, so we've looked really at lots of things that are in or on the, the, the ground. Um, again, buildings can be in or on the ground. So yeah, so often buildings and structures can be quite or relatively easy to, to deal with. Um, lots of damage contractors are, are extremely you know, confident in dealing with buildings. Um, what's actually, and you know, they know how a building might have been built, um, you know, and often it goes without um, you know, any, any sort of uh, issue. However, one of the most important issues to consider are what's in, what sort of hazard materials and or radiological issues might be present within building structures. These will need to be moving safely, even with conversion, but definitely before demolition. The most commonly um, hazardous materials were asbestos. I'm sure you know uh, and have heard about asbestos. It was extremely common, uh, commonly used. It was a, effectively a wonder substance, chemically resistant, fire retardant, uh, thermal insulator, noise insulator, a whole host of things. And it was really easy to apply and dead cheap. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, dead was an appropriate word. It does kill. Um, so it is a highly controlled um, um, removal um, regulatory regime so it has to be done very uh, carefully a lot of people think about you know just asbestos as a friable uh, you know a very uh, um, something that can fall apart quite easily but it was used in hundreds and hundreds of different products so things like floor tiles bitumen sheets cement sheeting that you might see on roofs corrugated she sheeting asbestos insulation board or aib very very common around the site and it needs to be removed very carefully you might have to deal before you do it with anything structural issues that might require either temporary or remedial measures um, before you actually go on to the demolition. So demolition itself removes above ground structures, but what can often be more uh, difficult to deal with is actually with the removal of the floor slabs and the below ground structures. And there's lots of important issues that you might have to consider, which is why often the demolition stops at floor slab level. You may not know where all the basements are, so it's just often a best thing to sort of stop. Uh, contamination issues might uh, arise as you can actually mobilize, mobilize pollutants that are under um, concrete slabs, effectively as rainwater gets onto the site and it effectively starts to wash and migrate the sites out, uh, the, the contaminants off the site. So often this is why it's left until development and remediation to deal with the buildings at the same time. The future development might not actually need all the move, the removal of the foundation. So again, this is why a lot of people, time people actually stop at the, the physical above ground structures. Um, but what if the basements and floor slabs are removed? They need to be infilled appropriately to ensure that extra foundation solutions and uh, extra costs of the future development are not required. Um, they can also cause a nuisance if you remove the, the floor slabs. Um, you can generate dust as exposed soils, soil materials, and you can even let ecology get established, which as Lisa's outlined, you can get some quite interesting things come on site quite quickly. So yeah, you don't want to introduce a new problem for yourself. Is planning needed for demolition? Uh, most of the time, no, it's not. Um, unless you have buildings that are houses, dangerous or unsafe in way, scheduled in some way, uh, you're in a conservation area or you're in a, a site that requires uh, an EIA of some description, or you have a species habitat, e.g. bats present on the site, where you'll need to get a license from Natural England and then actually have delivered the mitigation, so the future bat, um, bat, bat habitats, before you can actually do with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the demolition. But there's a really important debate to be had between holding the site uh, without demolition or to going ahead to do the demolition. We've got security issues and liability issues from derelict buildings. You know, they can attract antisocial behaviour. They can blight the area. Um, you know, they're just not very nice to look at. But if you demolish before planning, 
you lose the ability to claim vacant buildings credit and you can uh, also lose the ability to offset against community infrastructure levy. Um, so demolishing early prevents these being um, actually claimed. It's also important that if some of the buildings are quite large, saving them before you got planning means that you can effectively replicate the quantum and scale of development that you might not be able to get if you, uh, you've already gone on and demolished your buildings. If you can go on to the next, uh, perhaps if you go through two slides, uh, we're going to go on to utilities and drainage. Um, so first of all, utilities. Um, utilities, we mean um, things like underground and overground cables, pipes and above ground plants for electricity, gas, potable water, telecommunications like telephone, cable, fiber optics, that sort of thing, and pipelines, although pipelines tend not to affect brown sites, they tend to be more um, greenfield site orientated. But you need to understand the locations of the, the, the utilities uh, and many brownfield sites will have far more present than the greenfield site because many of the buildings, the previous use of the site will have had you know, been served by a whole range of different types of utilities. Uh, many will be redundant but you won't often know where all of them are and often the sites themselves had their own networks rather than the providers coming on with you know connections to the utility networks they had their own capacities and things like hospitals that sort of thing often have their own redundant services so their own generators and electricity effectively ring mains but you need to understand just like any site what the capacity demand uh, and likely point of connection are for the future development um, now one of the good things about um, brownfield sites is that um, the sites will have had already had a connection, so you might not actually have upgrades uh, or significant upgrades like you might do for greenfield sites. This is where you can save some significant costs on the site, and it's actually one of those better things about a brownfield site. You're in an urban area close to roads where generally services are, so they're generally far easier to develop. However, there are big changes coming about um, sort of now and in the future. Building regulations 2022 are coming in. Uh, oh, sorry, building regulations 2020 are coming in in 2022, COVID's delayed them, and also the future home standard is in coming in in 2025. Uh, also changes to electric vehicle charging points, especially for fast chargers, are going to have significant implications. Effectively, gas will be turned off for future residential developments from 2025, and so will be reliant on electricity only, which is this effectively doubling or even tripling the, the electricity requirements. Unless it's the largest brownfield site that had significant use um, we won't be enough uh, electricity on site diversions might be required and or standoff uh, issues um, standoffs required from them you might have contaminant resistant water potable water pipes which might be needed to supply the site this is just to stop contaminants actually uh, migrating and coming through the plastic pipes depending on the type of contamination so hence the fact that this is where we have lots of things that are interacting and overlapping with each other and again Ross has already outlined some of the title issues, but you might have title issues that might have to deal with. And often the legal issues can be quite difficult and time consuming. And even when the utility is being removed, it can be very difficult to get the utilities co um, companies to remove the title restrictions. We've known sites where years worth of delays have happened just because uh, someone hasn't instructed the, um, uh, the right authorities to get the title altered. If you can go on to the next slide, please, to talk about uh, drainage of the site. This is a really important issue and it overlaps with the flood risk assessment. So we need to know whether the site has got a flood risk. Brownfield sites as well as greenfield sites can have flood risk and also what's the likely depth of the site and its immediate surroundings. And there are all sources of um, flooding, including breach analysis, which is effectively where things like canals, especially elevated canals uh, or coastal defences could be breached. Is the you know any any sudden outfall going to reach your site at, at all? There might be some sensitive end uses that might not be allowable, including um, residential uses, um, bedrooms, that sort of thing on the ground floor. But it's very important that things like public open space can sometimes be used for flood alleviation. Looking at the locations of underground and above ground plant for foul and stormwater. Again, it's very similar issues to the utilities. We need to know where the connections are, where the um, the pipeline runs are and that sort of thing. But again, brownfield sites might have already had the connection. Well, they would have already had the connections. So it mean, might mean there's at least some capacity. Again, a benefit of brownfield uh, sites. It can really interact though with the SUDS features that you require on the site. Generally, it used to be that brownfield sites could effectively um, consider what they're discharging 
um, and then you could negotiate with the local lead flood authority. However, now most brownfield sites also need to meet the greenfield runoff rate, or at least some sort of betterment will be required. Um, so some sort of suds features might be required. However, because of contamination or that sort of thing, you might not be allowed. Um, a, 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 it might not be possible to rely on infiltration or on-site um, balancing ponds, that sort of thing. So often you need such features that are harder features, which can be quite expensive, like underground storage chambers. But these can be put in the car park, so you can you can double up. It's really important that all infrastructure needs to be suitable for adoption by the local water company. But this can be very difficult to actually understand. Um, and again, are diversions needed at all? There's lots of licensing arrangements that could be in place with environment agency, bylaws, drainage consents, and a whole host of other things that can be quite complex to, to look at. And again, a um, bit like utilities, there could be ransom and title issues. So if you can go on to the next slide, please. This just shows some of the possible impacts about dealing with sites when you don't know whether you, you're dealing with utilities and drainage. Um, there are lots of dangers from utilities act. Uh, um, dangers from utilities on construction activities. There are three photos along the bottom. Uh, the, the, uh, the house uh, that's not supposed to be a dummy that that that's that has moved um, to the other side, uh, the other middle photograph. Where if you hit an electricity cable, you can explode. That's from health and safety document, and that is a dummy. So no one's been injured there. Water mains can have to be uh, impacted, which can cause significant disruption to the site and the local area. And houses have blown up through people and other things have blown up from people hitting gas mains. So it can be a very dangerous activity if you don't know your utility and drainage on site. But they can also impact the master plan and viability of the site. The master plan in the bottom uh, is a site in Taunton where originally this had about 450 houses proposed on it. It soon went down to about 130 houses because you can see a, a effectively a brown dash line zigzagging through the site. That was the major um, foul sewer for Taunton. It's possible to move it. It would just be an expensive and time consuming. But for that site, it was just completely impractical to move it. There's no way we could get commission um, the move. So it was just effectively a constraint on the development. So it really limited what you could do on the site. So I'm now going to hand across to uh, Laura, who's going to continue on. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm Laura Bell and I'm a Chartered Development Surveyor at Homes England. Um, we've considered the legal and physical issues, but without the buy-in of partners and stakeholders in the vision, um, brownfield development just doesn't happen. Um, we understand that it can be hard to get councillors on board early on, but it's really valuable to also get the local MP on board as well, as they can access uh, government departments and Lee and other ministers to help. Um, that shared vision also helps winning hearts and minds in the local community. Uh, there are two types of stakeholders usually. There's those that are prepared to get engaged and those that are not. Um, those that don't engage, you just have to keep persevering with them and often it can be over the years. Um, but those that do engage, they might not be happy about it, but usually if you can um, if you can identify uh, what the issues are, their needs, their personal or business interests and what they actually want out of it and um, you can often uh, get them on board and um, when you have the backing as well of councillors you can get a resolution to grant CPO this can be really helpful in getting stakeholders to engage and also actually um, getting them to the negotiating table. I recommend brainstorming um, a list keeping uh, keep adding to it and keep them informed whether it's community groups, um, utility providers, existing users or neighbours, um, some news is often better than no news at all. Uh, I'm going to now look at a case study, which hopefully will um, bring to life a lot of the issues that we've kind of discussed today, um, and in particular the challenge as well of working with a lot of stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, the case study is known as Station Approach. It's a former railway siding site situated next to um, Leamington Spa train station. 
and this scheme captures so many of the challenges of brownfield development. It's six hectare site and it really encapsulates the saying in development that small rarely means easy. And despite our best efforts to de-risk this site, there were still some surprises along the way. Um, the site does prove extensive site investigations, uh, stakeholder engagement and compromise really pays off. Um, I'm going to run through the issues quite quickly to give you an idea of the challenges we faced and how we got over them as well. Um, you can see from the picture where the train station is in relation to the site. There's a pedestrian underpass and um, there's also a pedestrian underpass between the two. Um, most of the site was used as overflow car parking and storage land. There was a car dealership um, and a bus depot. The rest, which is actually just out of shot to the south, was scrub and derelict railway sidings. And part of the land making up um, station approach transferred to Homes England in 2013 from the British Rail Board residuary, which is known as BRBR, um, and construction started in 2016. Um, with the majority of the properties completed in 2018 and the final phase is under construction at the moment. Um, however, what I really want to get across as well is that the council had a further 20 years of involvement in this site before the land transferred to Homes England. Um, they had full member support and had invested really significant officer time and money over the years. They jumped on every single opportunity to assemble the land um, and without the council's commitment, their real collaboration with stakeholders and their appetite for risk as well, it would still be railway signings um, and not the, actually the attractive gateway that it is today. Next slide, please. Um, so when that comes up, I'm going to talk about the ownership and um, the ownership was quite complex. Um, the star shows the location roughly of the train station now um, to the south of the railway line. Um, the purple land shows the council's ownership where there was street parking and shops and the council had also managed to get one of their really trusted partners, Waterloo Housing Association, um, the now Platform Housing Group, um, to buy the yellow land and when it came up at auction. And that was the main access and further car parking. Um, the purple and the yellow land together it could have been developed independently, but the council kept to their vision to regenerate the whole site. And without those, um, these proactive and fairly risky purchases, I think it's unlikely that the wider site would have been delivered. The green land um, was owned by Network Rail and was railway sidings and a car dealership um, and scrubland. The blue land was owned by Stagecoach and was used as a pretty successful bus, bus depot um, and it was right in the middle of the site. And then the red land is owned by Homes England and that included the access to the station by the underpass uh, to the east and more railway sidings uh, to the west. Next slide, please. Slide, please. There was um, also a number of uh, more legal constraints to deal with. Uh, Network Rail and BRBR had a legacy joint disposal agreement, um, which remained in place when the land was transferred to Homes England. Um, and that added an additional level of complexity to the deal as it was very much designed for a commercial end user in mind um, and very much um, protected Network Rail's interests. There was restrictive covenants where across the site, um, all the way across the site, and very much in favour of the railway and also the franchise operator who was Chilton Trains. Uh, the most restrictive covenant was the car parking that had to be replaced elsewhere. Uh, there was network rail, um, uh, oh, and network rail still have uh, rights of way as well over the site um, for access, um, which was required in an emergency. Um, and this has actually had to be designed into the scheme. Then over um, the green land to the east, there's a public right of way for pedestrians to get into the station. That's the underpass. That's quite heavily used. 
um, and there was also a major pipeline and associated easements with that that needed to be moved in, in the same location. Um, then there was development restrictions with a safe zone line, which was adjacent to the railway. Um, that's the red line that you can see, which restricted trees and buildings being built in the, um, beyond that point, but it did allow car parking. Um, there was legacy leases in place for small businesses who didn't want to leave. Um, and also Stagecoach, who owned their site, uh, which needed to be relocated. And this meant there was significant value in the council proceeding with a resolution to grant CPO. In the end, they didn't actually go beyond that point, and the, um, the CPO was actually enough of a threat um, to, uh, to get a Stagecoach into negotiations. It's worth noting that the council gained political commitment to the CPO fairly early on, um, and it was really fundamental to the delivery of the site. There's also adverse possession issues, um, where gardens had been extended behind this huge sleeper wall um, to the north of the site. And you can just see on um, a row of semi-detached houses to the north of the brown land. Um, and a lot of those houses had um, extended their gardens um, to quite a few metres up to the wall, um, which meant further legal challenges. Um, and those same residents actually were the res residents that were the most vocal objectors to the regeneration as well. Next slide, please. Um, so there's yet more um, on-site issues. Um, and those were Japanese knotweed, which had timescale implications for the development. We had a really short timescale to deliver this site. Um, so we had to burn it, then dig it out at great expense. And then it came back, so we had to burn it again. Um, the badgers and bats were on site and they needed accommodating, relocating. Uh, we had made ground um, with probably about a century of junk inside, um, fly tipping and the odd burnt out car every so often. We had contaminated land with, uh, Richard will hate me for saying this, but hotspots <laughs> of high contamination requiring a rethink um, from what was originally going to be a housing-led scheme, again, early master planning, um, with gardens, and it changed to an apartment-led scheme and capped. <laughs> um, dilapidated buildings that needed um, demolishing, um, and also some hidden basements, um, which is actually something we didn't know about until construction started, a bit like Richard again was saying earlier, um, and it proved that actually we should have paid for ground penetrating radar, um, which not only would have picked that up, but it also would have picked up some of the utility services that we weren't aware of. Um, uh, and that would have been really valuable in de-risking the site further um, and certainly understanding some of the additional costs of rectifying that. Next slide, please. It's really important for the council to work closely with all partners. Network Rail, Stagecoach and Chiltern um, have really different priorities to the Council, Homes England and Platform. Um, they had to, there had to be something in it for them as a result um, to get them talking. Um, Network Rail and Chiltern's priorities were securing the railway, um, improving car parking and um, money actually in that order. Um, but what really helped as well at this time was that um, development happened, um, the development happened at a time when Network Rail had really specific objectives to work with Homes England, which was really helpful. And Stagecoach weren't interested at all. The actually the only thing that brought them to the negotiating table was the CPO. Um, land values were really challenging and everyone needed to prove value for money. But this is still Leamington Spa and um, you know, house prices are high and therefore land values are reasonably high. And I appreciate some of your sites um, will have far greater viability challenges. Uh, significant affordable housing grant funding as well went into this site. Um, and the key was that actually everybody had to compromise. Next slide, please. In terms of the uh, lessons I'd say to take away, 
get a great solicitor as early as possible with significant experience of um, dealing with really complex sites, even if you don't think that your site is that complex, they'll help, um, they'll really guide you um, and under, uh, for you to better understand the title challenges, easements, rights of way restrictions um, that are so often found on brownfield land. Um, try and find as well someone in another council or public body that can act as a critical friend. Sometimes a five minute call to discuss something can save a lot of time and money. Um, make sure you get early engagement with partners and stakeholders. Um, if you can understand their priorities and needs, it's far easier to negotiate with them later down the line. Uh, get boundary surveys done as early as possible to identify the real boundary. Uh, understand the ecology and time implications to development, but also bearing in mind um, actually that the ecology surveys obviously have a, um, a time restriction to a lot of reports. Um, make sure geotechnical and environmental considerations are considered early on, um, capture utility surveys, um, and I'd say invest in ground penetrating radar as well. And if you um, know where contamination is early on, uh, it can be um, it can mean that a hot spot is capped rather than rather than cleaned up. Next slide, please. So finally, I just actually want to say that in partnership, it's possible to deliver the hardest brownfield re regeneration sites. Um, it definitely requires extreme dedication, relentless tenacity and commitment of council officers and a lot of due diligence. Um, but here from 2013 to 2021, the site has gone from an eyesore to an attractive and inviting gateway that you can actually see as you arrive at Leamington Spa by train. It delivered uh, 212 homes, 75% of which were affordable housing. The council had that vision up front and they kept to it. And the development has changed the whole perception of the station area. It now feels safe and welcoming day and night. Um, and that's actually everything from me. Hopefully it's been helpful in highlighting some of the challenges to consider for your sites. Um, and I'm now going to hand back to James for questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Laura. Uh, and thanks for all the speakers. That was brilliant. Um, sorry about the slide delays. There's always at least one technical problem, but I think the speakers handled, handled that admirably. So that was brilliant. Um, we, we have got a short amount of time for a, a question and answer session now. So if everyone could just come back onto their, their videos or the speakers, please. Um, so I'm just going to introduce uh, Robert and he's got a few questions that will ask the speakers. Thanks, James. Um, so I have three questions I'm hoping we'll be able to get answers to before the time's up. So the first one is uh, related to um, Richard um, and what he was sharing earlier. The question is, do brownfield landowners have to pay any tax, other payments on the land? If not, should government consider implementing this to incentivise delivery as the majority of brownfield sites in our area are owned by companies registered offshore? Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, there's a, probably a little bit of a response from Ross that can come in a little bit on this one too. Um, however, yeah, the, one of the problems with some sites are yeah, offshore, offshore developers, owners do own sites. However, if you are onshore, um, there are various incentives that are already in place. There's something called the land remediation relief, which are, is applicable to 150% of all eligible costs. And the term eligible is very, very broad. It considers everything from um, simple investigation. So the actual investigative processes all the way through to the actual remediation. It also covers things like Japanese knotweed and a whole host of things. Uh, so yeah, it covers 150% of the cost of the remediation. Um, and again, remediation is very, very broad. Um, so again, it, it covers a whole host of activities, um, but it is only reclaimable if you pay corporation tax. Um, you can claim back a very large amount, um, but yeah, that's the only thing that's, that's really present from that sort of side. Um, so just perhaps just quickly across to Ross on some of the other possi possible rates. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, so, um, I mean, obviously business rates relief is um, something that all uh, uh, registered companies can apply from. There are obviously specific requirements to COVID 
as well. So I think that the, my advice would be best to check with the VOA, uh, the Valuation Office Agency, or, or speak to your um, dedicated property professional for the area. There are some obviously, um, there are subtleties with the nature and use of hereditaments, and also there are implications such as sale as well, construction infrastructure levy, which can come into play when looking to um, um, uh, sort of mitigate business rates uh, charges. So it's not unfortunately it's not a simple answer, um, but um, and my recommendation really is, as, 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 as others have said, go and speak to your professional advisors. There are regional subtleties sometimes with these things um, and, and see what they say that they're probably going to be best placed to advise. Thanks, Ross. Um, and then one more for Richard, I believe. Um, could landowners be required to provide indemnities of some sort? Um, maybe all of the risk should not be uh, should not rest with buyers. Yeah, that's quite an interesting question, um, and inevitably it has quite a complex answer. Um, the, uh, inevitably, it's buyer beware um, with a lot of things. Um, often, the, the, the liabilities passes down to the buyer. Um, that includes going all the way down to the, the private residents that could be on the site and they could be liable for contamination that hasn't been cleaned up um, historically. So that's under part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act, which is effectively the contaminant land regulations, as people call them. Um, these days, though, uh, it'd be the local authority that's jointly liable if the site actually didn't have remediation. Um, and that's a that's a crucial pinning point uh, under the legislation these days. Um, Sometimes historical polluters would be still liable, but it's a very different uh, act and it's a very different regime to actually implement. And now most local authorities don't have the resources to deal with it. It's very expensive. However, there are insurances that you can be um, obtained, um, often quite competitive and quite cheap that can cover liabilities that might be viewed as ongoing through the site. It does need the local authority to agree that the site is suitable for use. So that's that crucial word or terminology that's in the national planning policy framework, suitable for use for the end of the, 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 um, the development. However, it does allow a lot of contamination to actually be left on site. So it could be taken out um, and uh, yeah, it would cover future owners and future liability. Um, however, yeah, it's, it is a very, very tricky uh, issue. Um, most companies want to pass everything across to the buyer. So people keeping effectively trailing wires of liabilities, most people just wouldn't sell it for that, um, you know, really, unfortunately. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. And then finally, Lisa, um, one question for you. Um, is it true that great crested newts have recovered so well they may no longer need to be protected in the future? OK, um, so great crested newts have declined significantly over the last 40 years, and I think any recovery will um, is yet to be seen, really. Um, the level of protection that they get is from European legislation, so the Habitats Directive, um, but the protection provided by the Habitats Directive has been maintained in UK regulations since our exit from the EU. Um, what you might have heard is that the Environment Secretary has recently announced plans to refocus the regulations, although he confirmed that this would be to maintain or enhance the current protections in place. Um, what's also useful to know, I think, um, in relation to some sites is that there's the d new district level licensing scheme that Natural England um, are now rolling out across much of the country, which enables a, a quicker and, and easier approach to dealing with great crested newts on development sites. So um, at the same time, maintaining the favourable conservation status. So um, some local authorities already have this system operating. And it's worth checking to see whether that might be a better way for you to deal with great crested newt issues if you've got them on your site. Thanks. Um, and all that's left to say is thank you to the speakers and thanks for everyone for attending today. Um, we hope to see some of you again at our future sessions. Um, so, bye. Thank you.